Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Iris Selten and I am a PhD student from Utrecht University in the Netherlands. I will present to you the results of our project that was a collaboration between um, Utrecht University and the Brain Center in the University Medical Center in Utrecht. Um, and the title of this talk is Reduced Brain Activation in Children with Developmental Language Disorder and children with 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome. Our title already gives away our most important finding, and in this presentation I will tell you um, the process of how we got to this conclusion. One of our co-authors, Nick Ramsey, is a shareholder in BrainCarta, a clinical fMRI company, and BrainCarta was not involved in this study. This research was supported by a grant from Utrecht University's research team uh, research team, Dynamics of Youth, and the funder was not involved in the research process. Most of you are familiar with developmental language disorder, which used to be mostly known as specific language impairment. In this study, we followed the definition of DLD that was proposed by the Cat Catalyze Consortium. In short, the core characteristic of DLD is severely impaired language development with persistent problems across several important language domains. Children with DLD receive support from professionals, such as speech-language therapists, and they may attend specialized education. It is important to note that the language problems of a child with DLD cannot be attributed to an obvious known cause, such as genetical or physical abnormalities, lack of language exposure, hearing loss, or low intellectual functioning. The absence of a clear cause of language problems can be really frustrating for children and their parents. In addition, if the cause for the language problem is unknown, our ability to intervene or early or prevent uh, language problems is hampered. It has been shown that a complex combination of various genetic and environmental risk factors is associated with TLD, such as being male or low maternal education level. This heterogeneity in risk factors hampers our ability to understand and explain why children with DLD have language problems. It is interesting that both biological and environmental risk factors influence early brain development. In turn, certain brain functions are especially important for our ability to produce and comprehend language. With the present study, we therefore aim to increase our insight into the pathways through which the various risk factors for DLD may cause alterations in the neural networks involved in language processing that in turn may lead to impaired language development. We took two steps to achieve this aim and I am going to guide you through them. So first um, we will carefully describe the alteration, alterations in the language related brain activity patterns in children with DLD. It is widely accepted that language processing involves an extended network of brain areas and connecting pathways. You can see an overview of those areas and the brain language system on this picture. Functional MRI studies in healthy children have revealed that brain areas activated during the performance of language tasks um, excuse me. I just realized that I should move this here probably, so that's what I'm doing now. Um, functional MRI studies in healthy children have revealed that brain areas activated during the performance of language tasks largely corresponds with those observed in, in adults. Furthermore, in uh, both healthy children and healthy adults, the left side or left hemisphere of the brain seems more specialized for language processing. Um, the current evidence on the representation of language in the brain of children with DLD is scarce and results on whether or not DLD is associated with changes in language laterality and language related activation levels in the brain have been inconsistent. This leads to a rather exploratory first research aim in that we will carefully describe the alterations in language related brain activity in children with DLD. As our second step, we um, aim to gain more insight in the neural processes involved in DLD 
by comparing the brain activity patterns of DLD with those of children with I needed to go to this slide with a genetically uniform population that has a similar behavioral language phenotype. I will tell you the rationale behind um, this comparison and then I will go on to the next slide which I already gave uh, a little bit away. So the rationale behind this comparison is uh, clarified in the picture that you see here. Um, if children with DLD and children from a genetically uniform population do not only share uh, difficulties in language development, but also share alterations at the level of neural activity, then we may assume that all different genetic risk factors that are associated with DLD affect neural language processing in a similar way as the genetic cause in a genetically uniform population. Then, a careful characterization of the genetically uniform population can contribute to our understanding of the neural mechanisms that are underlying developmental language problems and thereby increase our understanding of DLD. Then we get here. In the present study, we focus on children with a 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome um, as the genetically uniform population for comparison um, to children with DLD. For the rest of the presentation, I will refer to this syndrome as 22Q for shortness. Um, 22Q is uh, the most common genetic syndrome after Down syndrome. Children with 22Q are missing a piece of DNA on chromosome number 22Q, 22 on the long run Q on location 11.2. Um, so therefore the name 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome. Um, 22Q has been associated with uh, many different physical symptoms. Important are congenital heart defect and palatal abnormalities. In addition, a lot of cognitive and behavioral symptoms are associated with the syndrome, uh, such as mental disability, psychiatric problems, and important here, speech and language problems are one of the most prevalent symptoms in early childhood. Um, and they cause uh, a lot of concern for parents and professionals. Um, here you can see the most important language problems uh, that are known in 22Q. Um, but as far as we are aware, there are no published fMRI studies on language-related brain activity patterns uh, in children with 22Q. So, although there are phenotypical differences between 22Q and DLT, the similarities in the developmental language um, problems, they are quite similar, as you may see here in this graph. Um, so then we get to this picture. Um, given these similarities in language problems, it is possible that the language problems in children with DLD and children with 22Q share a common underlying mechanism. That is, the genetic alterations in 22Q and the risk factors for DLD may induce comparable changes in the neural networks involved in language processing that in turn may lead to similar language problems. If that is the case, we would expect the language activation patterns in the brains of these groups of language impaired children to be altered in a similar fashion compared to typically developing peers. Taken together, we come then to two research questions that you can see here on the slide. The first question is, to what extent do we see functional alterations in the language network during processing of spoken language in children with DLD and children with 22Q? And the second question is, do these alterations differ between children with DLD and 22Q in comparison to typically developing children? We continue with the methods of the study. And on this slide, you can see our inclusion criteria. Children with 22Q and TD children um, were recruited to our outpatient clinic, or children with 22Q only, I must say. Um, and all children with DLD were recruited um, through schools for specialized education for children with language problems. And this means that our children with DLD either had um, one score of at least two standard de deviations below the mean on a comprehensive standardized language test, or a score of at least 1.3 standard deviations below the norm 
on several subtests of standardized language tests in several language areas. Children uh, with DLD and 22Q were compared with a group of typically developing CD children of the same age, and these children were included in another fMRI study in which the same tasks were used. All TD children attended regular schools for primary education. Parents of all participants gave written informed consent for their child to participate in the study, and the, the study was approved by the Medical Ethical Committee of the UMC Utrecht. Um, here you can see our uh, procedures uh, and instruments. Uh, the functional MRI data were acquired on a Philips uh, 3T scanner. Uh, study participation started with a pre-scan session, and here participants practiced the fMRI tasks using a laptop. Subsequently, participants were uh, acquainted with the MRI environment using the MOC scanner, and before and after the MOC scanner preparations, participants and parents um, filled out two visual analog or VAS scales um, to indicate how much anxiety the participant felt while being in their MRI scanner and how enjoyable the participants considered participation. The VAS skills ran from 1, um, not anxious and very enjoyable, to 10, very anxious or, very, or not at all enjoyable. And if a, a child noted a score higher than 7, their participation in the study was stopped. In addition, language skills of children with 22Q and children with DLD were assessed with two tasks. Uh, the Peabody Picture Vocabulary Test and the Sentence Repetition Subtask of the Self 4. Um, then on the second day, uh, the real uh, functional MRI scan took place and um, children performed two tasks in the scanner. First, the story task or the language task. Uh, and here, participants listened to a voice of a female speech and language therapist who read a shortened version of a children's story. The story had a block design in which periods of spoken language alternated with periods of reversed speech. To maximally attract the attention of the participants to the content of the story, children watched colorful illustrations of a picture book. Second, a hand motor movement task, so the motor task, was used in this study to assess the presence of any non-language related differences in brain activation between the TD and language impaired children. During this task, a red or green colored circle was visually presented, which alternated with an illustration of a cartoon character. During the rest blocks, the circle was red, instructing the participants to relax and watch the illustrations. And during the active blocks, the circle was green, instructing the participants to squeeze the response button. Um, the data collected during the scanning procedure was processed following a standardized procedure. That first includes data pre-processing and the steps you can um, see here on the slide. So uh, pre-processing involved realignment to the first functional scan and normalization to standard space. Effects of head motion are prone to affect data quality and therefore motion correction was done following a standardized procedure. And statistical analysis was performed by fitting a general linear model to the data and then we generated contrast maps for each participant. And then you can see here the following steps of data processing. Um, first, we um, defined our regions of interest, um, so the language areas we were specifically interested in to see um, activation and compare the groups of children. So we generated a language ROI, region of interest, that contained four regions, Broca, Wernicke, the anterior temporal and auditory cortex. For um, the more detailed analysis of the language activation patterns, we also analyzed um, these uh, language areas as sub-area RRIs. So we took the whole language area and each um, area separately. And in that latter analysis, we also included the caudat nucleus as an ROI, since this area has been indicated to show atypical structure and function in children with DLD in other research. Uh, second, the lateralization index um, is calculated, and this is a measure that we use to investigate whether children predominantly show activation in either the left or the right hemisphere during language processing. We used a threshold-independent method to compute this index, 
and we computed the index for the total language uh, region of interest as well as for the sub ROIs. Third, we measured brain activation during language processes um, using the activation levels, and for this we uh, used the mean beta level. Um, the mean beta value is a measure of the size of a signal change that is induced by performing a task. In this case, the difference in signal between the normal speech and the reverse speech condition. We computed two mean beta values per participant, firstly using the 10% of higher beta coefficient, indicating the strongest activation, and second, um, the 10% of lowest beta coefficient, indicating the strongest deactivation. Finally, differences between groups in the lateralization and activation levels were tested for significance with um, one-way ANOVAs, and we used one for only correction for multiple comparisons. Then we get to the exciting part, the results of the study. Um, well, here you can uh, see our participants' characteristics, and um, some participants could not complete um, all tasks or the scanning procedure due to uh, anxiety, for instance, or too much movement in the scanner. Um, so this left us with a sample of 9 children with 22Q, 12 children with BLD, and 20 TD children. And um, as expected, you can see here that children with 22Q had a significantly lower um, IQ score than children with BLD, who had an IQ in the normal range. And um, we could also see that um, children with um, 22Q had somewhat lower vocabulary scores than children with BLD. We did not have um, IQ or um, language scores for the TD children, as I mentioned that they were um, uh, recruited for another study, so they only completed the MRI test. Um, then we come to the next part of our results, and here you can see uh, the group max maps on which, which we can visually inspect the brain activation patterns. And visual inspection of the language task group activity pattern of TD participants showed strongly left lateralized activation um, in the inferior frontal gyrus, the middle temporal gyrus, and posterior temporal gyrus. Um, activity was also found in the superior frontal gyrus and the bilateral posterior cingular cortex. Important to note is that the group activation patterns of children with DLD and children with 22Q showed um, activation in the left anterior temporal cortex in a similar location as TD children. Notably, lowering the threshold in the group map visualization revealed that both groups of language impaired children showed an activation pattern that was highly similar to that of the TD children. In the group maps of the motor task of children with DLD and children with 22Q, clusters of activity were found in the right cerebellum and the left sensory motor hand area. Okay, sorry for this pop up. Um, these uh, areas in the motor task also largely correspond to the respective regions that showed activity in the TD children. Um, then we computed um, the um, lateralization index. Um, and um, well, you can see the results um, here. And um, what you um, can see is that um, the uh, children with um, 22Q and DLD did not differ in lateralization. Um, during the language task or the motor task uh, from the TD children, so that is important to note. Um, zooming in on the language task, um, you can um, see the lateralization index on uh, the left side, so on the y-axis, um, and the upper, upper part of the graph indicates activation on the left hemisphere, and the lower part indicates activation on the right hemisphere. And um, so what you can see is that almost all children um, show mostly activation in the left hemisphere, both in the language ROI, indicated with um, the black dot, as well as the motor ROI, ROI indicated with the white dot. Then we come to um, the activation levels, and we computed the mean beta values 
um, per participant and per task using the 10% voxels with the highest beta value and 10% with the lowest beta values. And for the language task, for the top 10% voxels, there were significant effects of group for the anterior temporal, Broca and Wernicke sub right of the left hemisphere. Both our comparisons revealed that for left Broca language task activation in the TD group was significantly higher than in the 22Q group. And for the left temporal and left Wernicke areas, the TD group activation was significantly higher than that of both language impaired groups. And this finding that corresponds to early reports on uh, the dampened language activity uh, in these brain, brain regions of people and children with DLD. The mean beta values uh, between the other uh, between the two language impaired groups, so between children with 22Q and children with DLD, uh, did not differ for the left anterior temporal, Broca or Wernicke sub R right. Um, in uh, previous research, research, certain brain regions have been associated with specific language functions, but given the size of our sub R right that we used, it is difficult to draw a conclusion about which aspects of spoken language processing is associated with the lower language activation um, that we see in these children. Then um, we did some exploratory an analysis. Um, here we explored whether there would be a relation between brain alterations and intelligence and language impairment in the children with 22Q and DLD. Um, and I will summarize the results here um, from our model. Um, and uh, the most important result is that in left Broca, the relationship between sentence repetition um, was significant. And in addition, in left Broca, there was significant interaction effects of um, IQ and vocabulary. And notably, after correction for multiple comparisons, only the effect of the interaction between group and vocabulary scores in left Broca remained significant. If we zoom in on this effect, um, we see these graphs. And we see the relation between um, the age-corrected vocabulary scores on the PPVT on the x-axis and the beta values, meaning language-related brain activation, on the y-axis. And the analysis of the direction of the interaction between the group and language scores shows opposite trends for DLD and 22Q, DLD on the left and 22Q on the right. For the DLD group, lower vocabulary scores were associated with higher betas and higher vocabulary scores were associated with lower betas. And the 22Q group showed the opposite uh, pattern between vocabulary scores and beta values um, in the left Broca sub ROI. Well, there are some uh, questions that you may have had while listening um, to this presentation, so I will try to already comfort you with an answer. Um, First, we cannot exclude that one or more of our participants um, with DLD also had 22Q. However, we consider this possibility highly unlikely, uh, especially because um, um, DLD is based on the exclusion of any physical and developmental symptoms in other domains than language, whereas such symptoms are very common in 22Q. Uh, then, we did not ask comprehension questions after our scanning session for the language task. Uh, the nature of this task prohibited monitoring of task compliance during the scan. It should be noted, however, that levels of anxiety and enjoyment did not differ between the groups, and also task performance during the motor task was not significantly different between groups, indicating that all groups were similarly involved during the fMRI session at large. In addition, uh, we saw that all groups showed um, left lateralized um, activation, um, during the language task and also used uh, similar brain areas um, and also this indicates that language processing took place. Then, although sample size differences prohibit proper comparison of group activation patterns, they do not negatively affect the interpretation of the lateral lateralization indices and the beta values um, because we computed them for each um, participant individually. Well, I can imagine that you have uh, more questions, and I hope you have. Um, so I hope to see you for that at the Q&A uh, session uh, at the end, or later uh, in this session. Um, then I will tell you our conclusions. Um, here you can, uh, again, see the aims of our study. 
and um, the first conclusion. So first, um, we conclude that children with DLD and 22Q show decreased levels of anxiety in the anterior temporal and Guernica areas. And this suggests that the language impairment of both groups involves similar cortical areas. Our findings do not exclude the existing of partially overlapping neural mechanisms underlying the language impairment of children with 22Q and children with DLD. Despite the exploratory nature of this study, I will still um, discuss some possible implications of our findings and our future directions. So in the beginning of this talk, I mentioned that many different biological as well as environmental risk factors have been associated with the language problems in DLD. Based on our current results, we could tentatively infer that different genetic and environmental risk factors may all affect language-related brain functioning in a similar way, resulting in developmental language problems. In addition, some areas seem more prone for functional alterations than others. However, given our limited sample size, further in-depth investigation of the relationship between neural activity and language performance in children with DLD and children with 22Q remains required. Um, another way to approach this issue is to study other cognitive and behavioral characteristics in DLD and 22Q. Further similarities between these groups of children could indicate that overlapping neural mechanisms are underlying language problems of these children. Finally, this could indicate that these children could benefit from similar prevention and intervention approaches. Furthermore, this would indicate that a careful characterization of children with 22Q, who are often known from an early age, could inform us of early behavioral markers for DLD. With the 3T project, we further explore these questions. You can follow our progress on the website, or you can send me an email if you like more information. Finally, I would, th I would like to thank all the children and their caregivers for their participation in this study. I would also like to thank our um, research team and the professional and patient support groups. And uh, finally, I thank you all of being my audience, um, but mostly for your interest in our study.